We're just a few days into March at the time of this recording, and that means we're just over 60 days into the new year. So how are your patients doing with their New Year's resolutions? Are they crushing their goals or have they given up? If they're like 43% of people, they've lost momentum at the end of January. Researchers suggest that only 9% of Americans that make resolutions complete them, and 23% of people quit their resolution by the end of the first week. At the start of each year, countless individuals are eager to set ambitious goals, yet often find themselves falling short. Understanding these reasons is crucial to crafting strategies for sustainable success. But before we get into the topic for today, I need your help. With every episode I publish, I'm trying to get better at this podcasting thing. I want this show to be a 10 out of 10 for you. So what I need from you is your honest feedback. How can I make this show better? Please reach out to me on Instagram at examroomnutrition or shoot me an email at colleen at examroomnutrition.com because I truly want to hear from you so I can make this the exact show that you're looking for. So what do you like about this podcast? What could be better? What can I do that would make this show the kind of podcast that you would recommend to your friends? I would be so grateful for your input. And as a thank you for sharing your advice, you'll be entered to win a $10 Amazon gift card. All right. So for today's episode, we're going to discuss the common traps of goal setting and present some actionable strategies you can do with your patients to get them back on track. At the end, I'll walk you through an exercise that you can do with your patient that will help keep them focused on their goal. Remember, just because it isn't January 1st doesn't mean your patient can't hit the restart button and refocus their priorities. You're listening to the Exam Room Nutrition Podcast mini-series called A Provider's Guide to Helping Patients Lose Weight. I'm your host, Colleen Sloan. I'm an RD turned PA, and my goal is to give you the nutrition education you never had in school to help you be a more confident, compassionate clinician. This is part six of a 10-part series, and last episode, we discussed how to choose the right diet for your patient. Now, if you would like my notes on this series, I have created a companion PDF for you that summarizes each and every episode. You can find that for free at examroomnutrition.com slash weight loss. That's examroomnutrition.com slash weight loss. What I'm not going to tell you today is exactly how much weight your patient should lose because goal setting should be extremely personal for the patient. Goals need to be strategically different in a way that uniquely excites your patient. And as we discussed a few weeks ago, I'd argue that their goals should go beyond meeting a number on the scale. Okay, now hear me out. Let's say your patient wants to lose 20 pounds in six months. That would be realistic since there are about 26 weeks in six months, and we typically aim for one to two pounds of weight loss each week. However, what if at the end of six months, they only lose 11 pounds. Have they failed because they didn't achieve their goal? What about all of the incredible new habits they've picked up over the last six months while working toward weight loss? Do those account for nothing? Habits like eating out less, eating more fruits and vegetables, not skipping breakfast, choosing water over soda, learning to honor their cravings in a healthy way? Or what about other metrics like having more energy to play with their grandkids or feeling sexy in shorts? Do those not matter? When we only focus on a weight goal, the entire journey is missed and the patient feels like a complete failure, when in fact, they're not. And in my opinion, they've achieved far more than 11 pound weight loss. Goal setting that strictly focuses on a scale outcome often breeds self-criticism and self-condemnation, adding stress to our already hectic lives. We need to help our patients set goals that foster a journey towards self-love and compassion. So let's get into some of those common traps of goal setting. Trap number one, not reflecting on past successes and failures. I think an important place to start is having the patient consider scenarios in the past when he was successful at achieving a goal. Now it doesn't have to be health or weight related, but why was he successful? What about that goal felt doable for him? Also equally important is thinking about past failures. Why was it hard? What was preventing him from committing to that goal? Trap number two, setting overly ambitious goals. Now we tend to set aggressive goals at the beginning of a weight loss journey. Patients are eager to lose 75 pounds and be bikini body ready, hoping that with enough willpower and self-discipline, they will be successful. 
But both of these fall short in the face of the inevitable daily grind and uncertainties of life. The remedy for this trap? Shrink the goal. Shrinking the goal to small, daily, attainable habits is the best way to maintain consistency. Make the goal easy for your patient. Making it easy is the best predictor for sustainability. Ask your patient, what actions can you do to support this new habit? What can we do to make this easy? Is there a current behavior that the new habit can be attached to? For example, if your patient wants to eat more fruit, can they eat a banana while they're standing there waiting for their coffee to brew? This is a technique called habit stacking, where you take advantage of your current habits by pairing them with new ones. Many people start building habits by focusing on the end goal, but trying to tackle the whole thing all at once is much too hard and it leads straight to frustration and failure. If a patient's goal is to eat healthy, that habit actually starts by the patient purchasing the fruits and vegetables, getting them washed and prepared, and packing them for the day. So help them consider the easiest thing to do first that gets them closer to their goal. Now, trap number three is not planning for obstacles. Unfortunately, most of our days don't go exactly as we had planned. We hit snooze too many times and now we don't have time for breakfast. Or the baby spit up all over our clothes and we won't make it to the nine o'clock gym class. Or we receive terrible news at work and we just want a Twinkie on the drive home. Obstacles are a fact of life, but we can plan for them. So have your patient think of every possible scenario, even worst case, that could interfere with their goal and how they can overcome the issue. This will reduce the possibility of setbacks or failure. Trap number four, strictly focusing on the outcome, not the process. Without clarity in daily actions, our behaviors quickly go back to a comfortable default as willpower and novelty diminish. The remedy? Make the habit enjoyable. There should be enjoyment in the process. Have your patient consider, what is the way to move closer towards my goal without adding too much friction or tension to my life? What are some enjoyable actions that support my goal? We know that behaviors that are habit-forming, like taking drugs, eating junk food, scrolling on social media, are associated with a higher level of dopamine. Now, if your patient can find a way to group together their new habit with a behavior they already enjoy, makes it much easier to want to do it. James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits, calls this temptation bundling. It works by linking an action you want to do with an action you need to do. For example, if your patient enjoys podcasts, an action they want to do, they can allow themselves to listen to podcasts only when walking, an action they need to do. Or if they love audiobooks, they only listen to audiobooks while cooking dinner at home. This leads to anticipation and excitement for the behavior they already love, and it makes the new behavior that much easier. Trap number five is setting goals alone. Studies show that people who set up a way to be accountable for themselves will be twice as likely to achieve them. Accountability means that you are responsible to someone else to accomplish the goal. This can be motivating for some. And as healthcare providers, we can be that accountability partner. Bi-weekly or monthly check-ins can be so beneficial for the patient to know that they aren't doing this alone. But if this causes too much anxiety or guilt for the patient, then I would suggest they find a community of like-minded people to connect with. One of the most effective things you can do to build better habits is to join others who are currently doing that behavior. There was a common saying I heard when I was younger, and it goes like this, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Meaning, if you hang out with the right crowd, you're likely to have a successful future. And the same holds true for the wrong crowd. The people we surround ourselves with have an immense impact on our beliefs, behaviors, and attitudes. The same is true for habits and lifestyle. If your patient's desired behavior is normal to those around them, it'll be easier for them to stick to it. New habits seem achievable when you see others doing them every day. For example, if you're surrounded by friends who drink socially and your patient is trying to stop drinking, it's going to be very difficult and honestly somewhat awkward for them. Yet, if your patient is around others who do not drink, then this behavior is normal and it'll be easy to accept and pursue. Trap number six, setting vague goals. You know the ones, be healthy, lose weight, live longer, exercise more. These are too vague. I'd argue that a weight goal is too vague as well. Remember from a previous episode, weight goals can be frustrating for the patient if they don't meet that number. 
However, measurable actions are easier to attain. For example, I will exercise 20 days out of the month, or I will eat dinner at home five days a week. Those are much easier to measure and much easier to achieve than just saying, I want to be healthier. Trap number seven, being ready but not prepared. We all know the saying, proper preparation prevents poor performance. This is true in business, school, and in health. Being ready is easy. It's that initial excitement and motivation to start something new. But being prepared is a whole different story. It means knowing what obstacles might come our way and having a strategy to overcome them. This is where getting really clear on your patient's desired outcome is so important. What is the reward they're looking to achieve from this new behavior? Yes, they want to lose weight, but what is the actual benefit they're looking forward to? Is it feeling sexy in a bathing suit? Is it feeling proud at their daughter's wedding? Is it fitting into those old jeans? Maybe it's getting off those meds. Having a goal is just the beginning. It's the daily activities that matter most. So there are a lot of different strategies to help your patients set goals, and I wanted to share why I actually don't like the SMART goals and what you can do instead. Now, you remember the acronym from school? SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. This was like the god of goal setting back in the day, and honestly probably still is to this day. Although I agree with the idea behind SMART goals, I think it falls short because it lacks any excitement or emotion behind why we're reaching for this goal. What sets your patient's heart on fire when they think about their future? Have your patient think about themselves a year or even five years from now. What gets them excited? Is it a number or a metric? I honestly doubt it. It's probably a feeling or a result of achieving that number. Patients probably imagine the way they feel, free, confident, loved, happy, energetic, sexy. That's the magic of goal setting. The flutter in your heart will get you where you want to go, not measurable, time-bound, stale objectives. Now, before moving on to a helpful exercise you can do with your patient, here's a quote from James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, that I think puts the nail on the head to this point. It goes like this. Ten years or one hour. Those are the two timeframes worth prioritizing. 10 years is shorthand for thinking longer term than nearly everyone else and doing things that are really ambitious or meaningful. Most of the deeply meaningful things in life require long time horizons, building a business, cultivating a happy marriage, growing a family, getting in the best shape of your life, etc. He goes on to say, how do you work toward the 10 year things? In one hour increments. One hour is shorthand for doing things that can be accomplished from start to finish in a single session, like a good workout, a good writing session, reading a chapter of a book, going on a fun date. The key is that you finish with something accomplished, not with half work still waiting to be completed. If you spend one hour working toward a 10-year project and you repeat this day after day, you're going to end up living a lovely life. Ah, don't you love that? All right, well, here's an exercise you can do with your patients. You'll need two pieces of paper and a pen. This can be quickly and easily done in clinic, but the patient should finish this at home on their own time. Now we're going to be brainstorming two specific things. One is their main goal with small, easy actions that they can do that will help them get to that goal. The other is understanding all potential barriers and brainstorming solutions so that they can be prepared. All right, step one on one piece of paper. Write their main, overarching, big picture goal in a circle in the middle of a paper. Then draw lines outward from the circle, so it looks kind of like a sun. At the end of the lines, draw a smaller circle, and in each of those circles, write smaller actions that the patient could do that would get them to their main goal. So, for example, their main goal is to lose 20 pounds, let's just say, so that's in the larger middle circle. Then in the smaller outer circles, they've decided they want to maybe eat three fruits and two veggies daily. Another circle might be cook from home five days a week. The other circle could be drink only water five days a week. Maybe the final circle could be walk for 20 minutes every day. Now, it doesn't really matter how many lines with circles are coming out of the main circle, but there should be a few as these are the mini goals or the mini actions that the patient is working towards that will help them get to their main goal. 
Next, have them choose one of those smaller actions to implement this week. For example, they chose to first focus on drinking water five days a week. So around that action, I want them to brainstorm ways to make it easy. They could purchase a large water bottle and fill it every night. They could place smaller water bottles in places they frequently sit. They could drink 16 ounces immediately after brushing their teeth. That's the habit stacking strategy we talked about earlier. You get the idea. I would suggest working on only one action each week. If successful, move on to another smaller action and brainstorm ways to make it stick. If it's too overwhelming, stick with one action until it becomes part of their daily routine. Before you know it, the patient will be moving around that large center goal through smaller actions, which results in the final achievement of them meeting that big overarching goal in the middle. All right, the next thing they need to brainstorm are barriers or obstacles that they may encounter. So what I want you to do is write their small action that they chose to work on this week. So for our example, drinking more water, write that action in the center of another blank piece of paper. Then draw lines outward, just like we did before, creating almost like a sun. On each line moving away from the circle, write a barrier or obstacle that could arise. And at the end of the line, write one or two strategies for overcoming that obstacle. So for example, sticking with our goal of drinking water five days a week, the patient would write that in the middle of a circle and on the lines going outward, she would write her potential barriers with some strategies surrounding it. So for example, one line she might write craving soda. And at the end of that, she could have a strategy that would say she would have some cans of sparkling water on hand for when plain water gets boring. Another line she might write that she is forgetful. So her solution around that could be to set an alarm that goes off every two hours to remind her to drink 16 ounces of water. So now the patient has one large overarching goal with multiple smaller actions that support that goal and a plan in place when life happens for each specific action. As each action is mastered, they continue to work toward another action. This also sort of gamifies habits as well. It breaks it down into little chunks so it feels doable. James Clear says bad habits repeat themselves again and again, not because you don't want to change, but because you have the wrong system for change. Well, my friend, now your patient has a system in place. All right, here are some final thoughts or habits that can help your patient stay committed. Now, the real killer of goals is unclear direction. When patients lack direction, they're surrounded by noise in a sea of confusion new supplements and new fad diets, this new trick to boost your metabolism, the patient needs to stop and ask themselves, do I have a roadmap? Do I know where I'm going? This prioritizes, streamlines, and focuses us like nothing else. Have them constantly go back to that diagram that they worked on to see what their action steps are. I'd suggest that the patient set maybe 10 to 20 minutes each month to revisit the goals that they set. This will keep a constant reminder to remain diligent and focused. Also taking five to 10 minutes of every morning planning for your day can be incredibly helpful. Have them consider, what is my long-term goal and what are critical actions I need to take today to move me closer to that long-term goal? Nutrition and metabolic health is a marathon, not a sprint. Create a long-term vision for your patient because if it's doable, they'll be successful. And if they're successful, they'll be consistent. And when they're consistent, I promise you, their wildest dreams will come true. All right, that's it for today. Thanks so much for hanging with me. Next week, I'll share practical tactics to help your patients reframe failure. We'll turn mistakes into learning opportunities, paving the way for progress and success. I'll see you then.